The Ateneo de Manila is building what it says will be a center of creativity. It's called Arete, a Greek word for excellence. It will have a new museum that can more properly display the school's rich art collection, theaters and studios for the performing arts, and non-traditional classrooms and laboratories for discussion and experimentation. The objective is to spark and encourage creativity, not just in the arts, but perhaps inspired by the art that's so close by in other disciplines as well. The project is the brainchild of Ateneo President Father Jet Villarin and will be headed by Yael Buencamino. Father Jet, Yael, thank you very much for welcoming us to the soon-to-be old art gallery. So, Yael, you lorded it over this art gallery before, <laughs> before you were appointed to head Arate. What will you be able to be do in that new building that you couldn't do here? The new uh, the art gallery director, Boots Herrera, has a lot of plans for the new space. Um, she'll be able to display the permanent collection. We have three galleries to display the permanent collection which will allow teachers to incorporate the um, pieces from the collection into their lessons. At the moment, we have to rotate the exhibits. When we have it there, it'll be there fairly permanently so they can actually plan ahead and use the artworks like these ones, the social realist ones when they're discussing the history of the Philippines. She also has a very active exhibition, uh, contemporary exhibition program planned. We have three galleries upstairs dedicated to changing exhibitions. There is a, an outdoor sculpture garden where we're commissioning people to do installations. How many pieces does the whole collection contain? Um, close to a thousand pieces. How many in this soon-to-be-old gallery could you exhibit at any one time, roughly? Probably about 15% of that because the other space would be would use for changing exhibitions. And when you move, how much of the collection can you show at any one time? We'll probably be able to show about, I'd say, 40% of the collection, 50% of the collection while having a changing exhibitions program. So people can come back to their old favorites and uh, be surprised by something new. And it'll be easier, I'm sure, to be moving the artworks around or moving them in and out of storage. Yes. As compared to your... Yes, and yes, because now we have secret storage. We create walls so that we have more storage. <laughs> so behind this could be storage. Yes, <laughs> and it probably is. Um, and we have higher ceilings there so we can display larger works. Artists can get more creative when we commission them. So that building doesn't just have the new art gallery or museum, um, but other, other functions as well. Uh, students, faculty, and visitors have been seeing that come up over the last few years. It's, it's a different looking structure compared to most other Ateneo uh, structures. Why did you decide it had to look so iconic? <laughs> well, you know, several architects presented their designs and we thought that this spoke to a particular vision. The, we're trying to create, it's not a cultural center that we're creating here, we're cr trying to create an, an ecosystem for innovation, for creativity. And this vision, I think, is, is fueled by what we see around us, uh, the, a, a digital economy that's on the rise. So we thought that we need to build this, this hub. But there are many hubs that look quite boxy. <laughs> this one doesn't. Why is that? Well, I think <clears throat> that was on purpose. In fact, if you look at the east part of the building, it's very linear. It's very, actually, it's diagonal, it's rectilinear. That reflects the logic and structure of the disciplines. On the west wing is a, is a curvilinear structure. It's slanted. It looks like an amoeba, a piano, or even a fidget spinner. <laughs> so it's fluid, and it reflects the intuition, the fluidity of, of culture and arts. And, uh, and I think the key structure here is the bridge. That's the key artery that connects art, culture, 
and learning. That's so metaphorical. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that the metaphor reflects also the reality. <laughs> Before we talk more about the, the center, Yael, what else is in that building aside from the gallery? We're going to have an 850-seat theater, um, a black box theater. There will be spaces for lectures and art workshops. Let's talk about the theater for a bit. The college itself, uh, at the college level, doesn't have a theater now, is that correct? Not one that big. <laughs> <laughs> not a real, not a real theater. <laughs> so for, for the first time in a long time, there's going to be a real theater and it's going to be 800 seats large. Aside from that, you said, what else would there be? A black box. We already have a black box now um, in the old COM building, but we have so many theater groups and theater activities. We have a theater arts program. We have about four theater groups in the college alone. So there's always a need for more some of them still, spaces. Some of them still using um, repurposed classrooms, right? Yes. It was like that when I was here too many years ago. <laughs> Yeah, we, had, we even had theater at the cafeteria. And when you move to the other side of the building, the, the, one that, the straight one that, that reflects the discipline of the sciences, what else, what, what will you find there? We'll have um, a Le Cordon Bleu Institute on the ground floor. We will have sandboxes, computer laboratories. Uh, we're going to have a maker space. And a maker space is a space is a space that's equipped with technology to allow people to create artifacts. Um, it's a space that artists and designers can use. It has, it'll have 3D printers, laser cutters. Um, is that the sandbox? Not yet. Not yet. <clears throat> What's the sandbox? Maybe you can talk about the sandbox. Sandbox is a playground. <laughs> uh, it, it, if you go there, you, you'll see a warehouse. So with no boundaries really. So it's it's where we hope to have groups come together from different departments and also beyond the school actually, so that they can actually work on wicked problems, but not just solving problems. They might also just want to play. And in fact, much of discovery comes from this spirit of play, uh, from wonder. So we, we hope we can, we can sort of catalyze that, that process here in this, in this area. Do you remember when the idea came to you to build this center? How it happened? What were you trying to address? I don't think there was one particular moment um, I was still in, I was actually still in Cagayan. <clears throat> you were president there before, there, yes. before coming here. And then I was told I was coming over and I said, well, what do we need? What can we do or what should we be doing? And I, I really thought that creativity would be important. Um, as I told our faculty in a digital economy, that, that economy will, will run on different engines. Hardware will be important, but I think the most important component will be software. And by that, I mean content. By that, I mean uh, the connectors. Connectors. Well, as you can see, the Internet of Things, for instance, uh, is happening because people and gadgets and services and goods are being connected via technology. And it's software, the Uber Uberization of the economy so to speak. So we will see more of these connections by, via software, um, via um, this. <laughs> but you're not putting up a new department. No. You're giving, you're creating a home which will be used by whom or will be used how? Well, you know, a university is traditionally structured according to departments, right? And so you're not creating a department of innovation? No, no, no. So <clears throat> And often enough, these, these departments really don't talk to one another. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's, I think uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the system itself, right? I mean, there are, you have different vocabularies. Eh? Um, so what we, are, what we have been doing is creating hubs. Hubs that will actually be attracting people from the different disciplines to come together 
beyond their, you know, their expertise, their competence. So this hub is a creative, creative hub that will hopefully you know, make these crossovers, these departmental crossovers. So you said you've been trying to do this or you have been doing this. Well, what's it's happening. Been, what's been lacking? Well, it's, it's, it's a culture, I think. So, um, and to change a culture will take time. Um, it's not just a matter of bringing people together in one space. It's already happening with or without the Arete, actually. <clears throat> our engineers, for instance, have been linking hands with our fine arts people. Um, so, and also linking with the outside world, with business, with uh, legal, the legal world as well. So we're, we're beyond, we want to go beyond prototyping and we'd like to see this ecosystem through. Which means creating this, this structure and this space for that to happen. And without that structure and without that space, were you hobbled? Well, I, th I think we can do more. And in fact, the added value here is, is the presence, the closer presence, the proximity of the arts and culture. And that's the new thing here. Uh, we, we think that if you have this interlocking or interweave of disciplines and in, in an ambiance of culture and the arts, I think we can create new, new stuff. Do you see that? Yes, definitely. I think um, both Ricky Abad, the artistic director, and I um, are eager to see that happen. Ricky's actually thinking up of already a theater um, theater programs that will work with the other departments that will maybe tackle um, global warming or <clears throat> you know trying to come up with different ways to envision these current problems and maybe lead to new ideas for solutions. Do you have a model for what you're building? We have some models for interdisciplinary collaboration abroad, like there's the Bellagio Residency um, that brings together people from different disciplines to think about one issue or like traffic or crowds. Um, and it doesn't actually ask of them a solution. It just brings them together to talk about their that issue from their disciplines, whether it's psychology or art, science. What kinds of challenges <clears throat> have you faced in designing and building this structure? <laughs> that many. <laughs> well, the, 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 the West part, the, the, the amoeba part, <laughs> uh, I, I was told by the contractor that it would have been easier and cheaper if we just replicated sec, if it were a box, you know, second replicates first, third replicates second, right? So you have a straight structure. This is so fluid and it's slanted eight degrees. So even structurally, I mean, engineering wise, it's a challenge. Uh, how to work with gravity, actually. So. You're a physics major and doctor, you know that. <laughs> yes, yes, so I appreciate the, the difficulty. But you seem not to have appreciated the cost. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just the physics. <laughs> yes, I'm not an economist. <laughs> that's your excuse. <laughs> so, well, anyway, so that's, that's, that's just one challenge uh, to the building of this, of this structure. Internally, with the theater, with the galleries, what kinds of challenges have you faced there? I think we were very lucky because we were brought in early in the design process so the theater people and the museum people were brought in and asked what our needs were from our spaces so we were able to converse with uh, architects and they generally uh, they generally adapted to our needs uh, I think the one thing would be the slanted walls but actually that makes it somewhat challenging and interesting for us to hang our show, so we have to be a little more creative. In fact, one of you told me that the fact that um, few things there are straight is uh, part of the philosophy of that building. Well, if we wanted to, sorry, think out of the box, I guess, you don't want boxy structures. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, yeah. If, Part of it, is my physics is coming in. So we we are used to three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional universe, right? 
when actually scientists tell us we probably in, inhabit a four or eleven dimensional universe. I haven't heard that yet. Don't we shock. Have, <laughs> I mean, how can you imagine four <laughs> eleven lines running perpendicular to each other? I can only imagine three. So it, it's think it's thinking that way. I think that helps us reimagine what new things we need to do or can be. Uh, and I think that a structure that reflects that fluidity would, would help. When you, when, you, when, you come up for, when you came up for re-election as Ateneo president, do you tell the board that you think that the world has 11 <laughs> di <laughs> <laughs> You were talking about the sandbox a while ago, and I think you earlier told me that one of your ideas was all the walls there would be glass. And that people would write on the glass as opposed to whiteboards. What's the idea behind that? Well, actually, I don't know if there will be walls. There, there might be walls. Right now, when the original design had about six compartments. And we said, no, take out, take out the compartments. We'd like people to see each other. We'd like people working, let's say, on traffic or on peace, seeing those who are working on climate and other issues and I'd like we'd like this this uh, intercourse so to speak to happen more more spontaneously we'd like to create that so there will be walls and there will be perhaps random walls where you have uh, scribbles and people will be able to see that as well from other groups and if somebody was working on a secret project would he be welcome there uh, I guess <laughs> he'd have to uh, yeah, create his own little uh, cubicle, perhaps. One of the things you've told me is that this is not just for the Ateneo, that there will be connections and outreaches outside Ateneo. Can you talk, to, talk a, a bit about that? I think that would happen a lot, especially in the art swing. Um, we really want to be able to reach out to the community to present cultural activities, visiting museums, going to the theater, watching dance performances, listening to concerts as, a, as an alternative and everyday leisure activity. To present ourselves as an alternative to maybe walking around the mall. Um, we'd like to be open to the community around us. Uh, we'd like to be open to more, but given the traffic, we assume the community <laughs> around us. <laughs> um, That's going to worsen the traffic at the other at the three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd like to be able to for them to come on weekends, walk around, see the art, and feel welcome in this space. Do you think um, some uh, theater groups, for example, from the outside will be using the space? Yes, I think so. Um, Ricky Abad is very active with other theater groups. The Shakespeare Festival is being organized with, um, with a group from UP. He's been speaking also with other smaller theater groups. We've always been very involved in the art world. We invite artists from outside to work with us. We work with cultural institutions to bring in films, exhibitions. I think you're touching on what you've told me is going to be called some kind of Ateneo cultural season. What's the vision there? But Ricky Abad's vision there is to create um, a season throughout the school year, I guess we will follow the school year, um, that will showcase Atene Ateneo performing arts. The idea, what he's told the performing arts groups that he's met with is that um, they, to perform in the big space of the Arete, they need to level up. So, to create something different from what they normally do or work with the other groups. So in his meeting with the groups, he met not only with the college theater groups, but with the grade school and the high school. So we're hoping that there'll be the, um, a performing ecosystem and where the dancers, you know, work with the glee club, yeah. that sort of thing. And this will start as early as next year? Yes. Father, yes. after the building is up, um, I believe the soft opening is September, the more complete opening is January or thereabouts, February. February. Um, once it's up, what's next? Well, we've, we've just created a new hub, another hub. Uh, this hub is on education. Uh, we call it SALT, the science and art of learning and teaching. 
and it will be actually housed in the area there. We're looking at innovation in, in education. So we're hoping that this hub will also be another hive of activity uh, where we can make a difference in reinventing the way we learn and, and teach. When you think about that topic of reinventing education, what inspiring examples or dreams do you have? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's inspiring, but I see a lot of challenges, really. Uh, the digitization okay, of, of our world has led to a lot of obsolescence and disruption. I often ask myself, will education be disrupted? And how long do we have? And what, what is it that we, as educators, still have to offer from the tradition? I, I think I don't have any answers, but I hope that by creating this hub that we will face this challenge of what education can be or should be in the next few years. Um, I think people now are learning differently. Uh, our young ones are, are adept at certain things, but they're also poor in certain things. Education is still a social, is still a social encounter. Too. So how do you maintain that social connection in a digital world? So these are the, some of these challenges. So I hope SALT, this hub, will, will help. Father Jet, Yael, thank you very much for welcoming us to Ateneo. Thank you too. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you, Coco.